that indeed I did. But I got there and the Lord really blessed the time. There was a lot of excellent ministry. I got to preach, fellowship with a small uh, Baptist church there. I got to teach my students. I got to minister with uh, our TLI missionary on the ground there. And there was a common theme that ran through the whole thing. Uh, opportunities to fear. COVID over there doesn't really exist anymore. But as I was going about, uh, every once in a while I would think about having to come home and all that would uh, go on there. And I thought about what happens if I get COVID while I'm in Serbia and there's much less restriction, etc. What happens, what happens, what happens, if, if, if. And every time that uh, sense or fear or doubt came to me, I would remember the scriptures. My mom taught me many, many years ago, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So then it came time to come home. And I felt led not to do what I was supposed to do according to the government, to fill out the uh, app for their phone and all that and book a hotel. And, and there was a bit of concern with that because maybe they'll turn me away at the airplane or maybe they'll give me a ticket or whatever, but I felt that it wasn't the right thing to do. So got on the plane with much trepidation didn't get on the plane to start with because I got to Belgrade Airport and they said, you can't get on the plane. Three in the morning, what a thing to hear. So I got on the phone with the travel agent and I prayed. Turns out because I'd been routed from Amsterdam to Minneapolis, I wasn't allowed to get on the plane because they're not allowing any transit. So they said, we cannot let you get on this aircraft unless you have a ticket at the other end that'll let you leave Netherlands. So we prayed and literally with five minutes to spare, they were closing the door behind me. I got on the plane. And there was one problem then. I had had a PCR test in Serbia, but I had to have it on Thursday because that was the only time I was able to get it. And so it wasn't going to be good for the new flight that I had direct from Amsterdam to Calgary on Monday. So I got to Amsterdam and they said, they won't let you on the plane with this test. Okay, now what do I do? I'd been praying the whole way because I wasn't sure. Well, she said, there's a way you can get a test in the airport and because you have an extra day, you'll be able to get your new test before you get on the plane. So I spent a sleepless night in Amsterdam airport praying for you guys as you were having your service. I was sitting in a chair looking out the window at rain in, in Amsterdam, but uh, got on the, the next plane. And as I was coming back, I started to feel worried, doubtful, questioning, what's going to happen? I don't know. Uh, are they going to put me in cuffs? Are they going to give me a ticket? Are they going to even allow me in the country? I don't know. And so I prayed. And as I was about an hour out and I really had this wave of concern, fear, doubt come over me, I was reminded once again, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I had gone to do the work of God. I didn't go to have a holiday, hmm. let me tell you. I spent four hours a day teaching through a translator. You should try that sometime, it's exhausting. But I'd gone to do the work of the Lord. And so I had to trust that whether I ended up in a, in a prison at the bottom of the ocean when the plane fell out of the sky or home in my bed, whatever happened, God was in control and it was him who was at work. So about an hour out, I managed to actually settle down I read Matthew 6 and it says, don't worry about anything. Don't worry. Trust God. So I trusted him. Got there, got up to the customs agent. They gave me a little paper form to fill out because I was one of the bad people who couldn't use a telephone apparently. And when I got to the agent, people were praying. And he was an older agent and he was a wise agent, I guess. And he looked at me and he said, oh, uh, how's your day going? And I told him, well, it's been, it's been pretty lousy getting here. It took a lot of work. I had to get a fresh PCR test. It was, it was quite the hassle. I'm tired. And he said, oh, what were you doing in Serbia? And I said, well, I was teaching. Oh, where were you teaching? Baptist school out there. I teach church history. Oh, is this a regular thing? Yeah, I go once a year. 
okay, well, it's, uh, you've got a fresh COVID test and you're a teacher, so you're exempt from quarantine. <laughs> and he put a little red check mark on my, on my customs ticket and as everybody else was being routed into the hall to do all the tests and to get loaded up on the wagon to go to the hotel, I walked out the door. God is in control of this universe. And when we serve God, when we do the work of the Lord, we don't need to fear. Not because this world isn't fearful, but because God is in control of this world every step of the way. No bug can get you without God wanting it to happen. No bus can hit you without God wanting it to happen. We are immortal until the day Christ calls us home. We are to be found doing the work of the Lord, obeying God, never looking to the right or the left, never doubting. And that doesn't mean we won't doubt, but it means in the midst of that, we turn to God, we trust, and we say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So that's your freebie for the day. All right, let us pray and we'll get into, oddly, a very apropos sermon today. You know what, can we stand? We didn't get to say the Lord's Prayer. When people asked the Lord how to pray, he said, pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your word today. In Jesus' name. Have you ever stopped to marvel at the world? I got to do a lot of that as I was flying over the the various places flying over Greenland and Scotland and it's really interesting the route that they take to get you to Europe. I was going across flatlands and then beautiful hills would spring up out of the perfectly flat ground, the Fruškagora Hills in Serbia and everything is so amazing about the world. All around us are towering mountains, majestic lakes and wonderful creatures and then if you zoom in you have microscopic organisms, weather patterns, your very flesh is just a miracle in itself. And everything exists for something. But what is that something? Who is it all for? Why are we here? Well, Paul takes time to show us. So we've been going through Colossians, if you remember, and we're going to keep going. Beginning in verse 15 of Colossians 1. Colossians 1, 15, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. By Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. The Lord Jesus Christ is the very image of the invisible God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the beginning of the story, the end of the story, and everything in between. He is the first of all. He is the creator of all in detail. This is not a small matter. I was talking to my brother Joseph yesterday and we were talking about apologetics and how you present the gospel and how you tell people about the world. And uh, this has been a, a thing that has changed recently where some decide that there's other ways that the world was created or there's other focuses of the world, but indeed that's the way it's always been with humans. We've always found other focuses for the world. The devil came in the Garden of Eden and he said, you can be God. 
You can be the focus. You can make the decisions. You can serve yourself. You don't need to follow me, or follow God, rather. You can have it all. You can know good and evil yourself and make the decision on what's good and evil. But the Bible says, He is first of all. He is about, is what everything is about. Through Him, all things were created. Not just the earth that we live in, not just the organisms that have developed, not just the mountains and the trees, but through Him, all thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities come into being. They bow their knee to Him, whether they realize it or not. This world, the orders of the world, the story of history comes from Christ. It's quite an interesting history. I spent this last week going in detail through church history from pre-Reformation to present. And there's a couple things that are common in the history of this world, in the thrones of the dominions. I teach my students, if you have a problem, there's one thing that church history teaches us. Do you know what that is? Burn it. Because throughout history, that's the way we've solved problems, is we've burnt people. But the history of the world is not a clean, beautiful, nice thing that always works, because it involves humans. It's a messy, painful, struggle thing, and that goes on till today. And yet God is in control of all of it, and God is at work in all of it. All, of it. all things were created through Him, and all things were created for him. We get into a bad habit of thinking that this world is about us, about humans. We get into this habit and it leads us to, to make poor decisions. We build our own kingdoms. We try to live for ourselves. We try to serve what we think will make us happy or fulfilled. And God says, all this is about him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Just imagine that baby in the manger, that Christ child who was born, laying there helpless, needing a mother to do everything. And at the same time, that Christ child was holding the very atoms of that manger together by the might of His power. All of this is for Him. He is before all things. And in Him all things hold together, and He is the head of the church. You know, we can get into a bad habit of thinking, it's our church. This is our responsibility. We lead, we rule, we guide, we teach, we preach, we minister. It is God's church, and we are merely His hands and feet and voice. Wherever you go, you find God's church. It's always got interesting problems because it's full of humans. You go to Serbia and the problems are people have long memories and they tend to hold grudges. Serbs are great for holding grudges. And you have churches that reflect the humans that are in them. But despite the problems here, there, or everywhere, despite the weaknesses, despite the struggles, God is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church and He is working in this world through his church and no amount of human stupidity can change that he is the firstborn the beginning the firstborn from the dead and in it, all this is done so that he may be preeminent all this is done so that he can be before everything else all this creation all of the church is given to us given to the world so that he can show his glory. When I teach my theology class, the first thing we do every day is we ask the question, what is the purpose of the world? What is the purpose of theology? And the answer is the glory of God. When you look through church history, the only thing you can say is the glory of God, because we don't come off looking very well, but he sure does. When we look at our lives, and I experience a, an entertaining flight and a an amazing walk past a, a checkpoint there where I should have been hauled off to a hotel quarantine, all we can say is the glory of God. God did something. He is meant to be preeminent. He is meant to be first. He is at the center. It is all 
about him. He's the one who made the universe. He's the one who sets the rules. And in the midst of that, he chose to do a powerful work. In verse 19, it says, In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. He's the beginning, the first of the resurrection, and because of him, all of us have hope. When you go to a place where darkness is really present, it's not hard, you can walk out the door. When you go to a place like Serbia and you see so much hopelessness, though, it's so important to realize that he has come to reconcile this world, these people, to himself. He's made a way to restore people. We get caught up in a whole lot of other things that we're supposed to be doing, a whole lot of other allegiances, even as a church. We get tied up in the present fights of the day and the worries of the day and the, the hot issues on the, on the news, you know, whether uh, Meghan Markle will have another interview with Oprah. And we get distracted by the world. We get distracted by our own personal fights and problems. But we forget the gospel. We forget that there is only one purpose to this life. There's only one thing that we're called to do, and that is to live and to preach the gospel. He did the work to reconcile us to himself. He made us able to be with him, to walk with him, to live with him, to know him, not just to hear about him. Serbia is full of Orthodox people, faithful built the second largest Orthodox cathedral in the world, spent untold millions upon it because they want to be faithful to their God. But the problem is, it's a God they've only heard of. It's a person they don't know. If you ask an Orthodox person, do you know God? Can you know God? Not really. They live in loss, in pain and suffering. And Christ said, I didn't come to bring you loss, pain, and suffering, legalism, and difficulty. I didn't come to give you a spirit of fear. I came to set you free from the fear of death and from the fear in life. Through his blood, he gave us hope and he made peace for us. But what does that make us then if we're not the center of the universe? If if all of this is about him, if he's preeminent, if he's the one who's done everything, then where does that leave us? Well, you were once alienated, hostile in mind and doing evil deeds. But he's now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him if indeed you can continue in the faith, stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you've heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, am a minister. We were once alienated from God and hostile to Him in our minds. We were doing evil deeds. We were sinners. That's who we were and who indeed we are apart from Christ. We were nothing and we continue to be nothing apart from Him. We have nothing that we can look at in ourselves and say, I'm pretty good on my own. But we have everything that we can look at in Christ. He reconciled us to him. His death made us his personal people. And he did it so that we could be presented holy and blameless. Blamelessness is such a good word because blameless doesn't mean perfect, but it means that we have done no wrong that we can be blamed for. That by the strength of God, he makes us able to walk. And when indeed we sin, which we do often, when indeed we fear, which we do regularly, when indeed we fall from the path, we doubt, we question, we turn, because we are, whether we like it or not, human, He forgives us. He restores us. He makes us above reproach. 
Not because the accuser of the brethren isn't there to accuse, but because when the accuser of the brethren points to what we do, he says, I paid for that. He makes us clean. If we remain steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, it's very easy to shift, to get distracted, to lose our way, to lose our focus, to allow other things to take precedence, even as we do the work of God. It's very easy to become distracted by the pain and the suffering and the sorrow of this world or just the petty doubts, fears, and annoyances. You know, I said to my friends, I wasn't suffering for the gospel going there. I was just getting annoyed for the gospel going there. It was tedious and tiresome to sit in airports and to deal with officials and all of that. But I wasn't suffering. And yet sometimes that's all it takes to push us from the path. Sometimes all it takes is an inconvenience or an annoyance. And God says, remain steadfast. Now, what should we remain steadfast in, though? Because there's lots of us who get our, arm, or our back up over a lot of things, right? And we want to get up our fists and fight over a lot of things. We want to dig in our heels and be stubborn. And he doesn't say be stubborn. He says stand steadfast in the hope of the gospel. This gospel that we preach is the only thing that matters because it's the gospel of Christ. He is preeminent. He is the purpose. He is the focus. He is all we live for. I believe there will come a day, maybe not for us, maybe for our children, I don't know when, when standing steadfast for the gospel here in Canada will mean some of the things that other people have experienced in other places in, this country, in the world. rather. I believe that standing steadfast may someday mean that we have to make a hard decision that leads to us not being able to eat, not being able to tend our families, maybe watching our children taken from us, as has happened in other places. But are we prepared to be steadfast in the gospel? One of the most important ways that the devil tries to get us is not with the dramatic decisions, but with the daily choices, the little things that can fly under the radar, the small ways that we distract ourselves from the truth. I just saw news the other day, there's a thing called Darwin's Arch. Have you heard about it in the Galapagos? Darwin's Arch was this rock arch that was named after Charles Darwin, who spent so much time there. Amazing, neat thing that God had done to make this arch. And it had stood for generations. But you know what happened to Darwin's Arch the other day? It collapsed. It fell in on itself. Not because someone had done something. Not because a great bomb had gone off and destroyed it. But because the erosion of the generations had worn the rock away. And it had fallen in. One little piece at a time. And our walk with God is the same way. If we allow the erosion of little choices to distract us from steadfastness in the gospel. If we allow ourselves to be distracted, pulled aside, torn asunder, then soon we will find that our faith is hollow and weak. Instead of trusting in God, we'll find that we've been trusting in ourselves or in some facade of, of righteousness. God doesn't call us to be half Christians limping along, finding reasons to pull our punches or walking halfway. He calls us to be all in for the gospel. And he says, I will make you holy, blameless, above reproach. I will do it all. And even standing steadfast, I will do that in you. Because if you try and do it on your own, <laughs> you fall. We're called to find our hope our purpose, our everything in Christ and His work. Not on the earth. Not in vaccines. Not in power. Not in wealth. We're not called to find our hope in the circumstances because the circumstances will be crazy. You read the history of the church and the history of the church is one of pain, suffering, torment, having to choose to stand 
in the face of things that want you to fall. But in Christ alone, in the focus of the hope of the gospel, this is an easy stand to make because God made it for us. This gospel, the hope of the gospel, which has been proclaimed in all creation and under heaven, will continue to be proclaimed because He is God. He is Savior. We are His. In the midst of a world where truth is losing value and where there's no purpose and hope for many, we have a simple focus. He is the image of God. He is preeminent. He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. He is the main reason for existence and we can follow that, trust in that. Staying firm in the faith doesn't happen by an act of will. It does not happen by working hard. It does not happen by judging others. Staying firm in the faith means truly trusting Christ, truly understanding that He is the only reason for living, that He is the only point. This world is offering us plenty of chances to fall away. In Serbia, it means ease, luxury, government favor, people not wanting to beat you up. Here, there's a lot of other things that falling away gives us. We fit in better when we give up the gospel, when we cease to believe in the way God tells us to live and to act and to do. The world is always offering us these chances. I believe that we'll not be able to dodge a choice as we have in the past. More and more we'll be called to, be, to stand up and be counted in what we do. So I, I hope that we will stand in the faith. The world will not like us. There will be many opportunities to find reasons to turn aside to the right or the left. But God is the meaning of life. When Jesus asked Peter and the other apostles if they would walk away when everybody else did in John 6, Peter said, where else can we go? You have the words of life and we have believed that you are the Son of God. Let's hope that this is true for us. So Cremona Country Fellowship, why do you exist? Why does this world exist? Do you see your Lord preeminent over everything in the world? Is He preeminent in your life? Are you ready to sacrifice for Him in great and small ways? Will you continue in the faith stable and steadfast, not shifting from your gospel hope? May God grant that we all remain faithful every day in every way. May we experience the full peace that has been bought for us by His blood. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank You for who You are and what You've done, and I thank You that You are the center of existence, the point of existence. I thank You that we know You. Help us to be steadfast. Help us to live without fear and doubt. Help us to be faithful to You in all things. We praise you and we thank you. We trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>